Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to design a parametric model for the number of earthquakes occurring over a year and in the process we're going to derive the Poisson distribution. Let's get to it. So this is about the Poisson distribution and our motivating example is that we want to model the number of earthquakes that occur in San Francisco over one year. In order to derive parametric models we need to make assumptions. So we're going to make the following assumptions. First, the earthquakes are independent. They occur independently. This is probably not true in practice because you have aftershocks and things like that, but we're going to assume that that's reasonable. Second, if we look at the probability of an earthquake in a period of small length t, that is going to be proportional to a constant lambda. What do we mean by that? We mean the following. Imagine that you have uh, that this is a whole year and now you look at a certain interval of a few days let's say oops that was that looks weird you look at a certain interval of length t you say okay what's the probability of seeing an earthquake there what we're saying is that when t becomes quite small the probability is approximately equal to lambda times t where lambda is a constant which you can interpret as earthquakes per time, as number of earthquakes per time. So you can imagine it in the following way. The earthquakes are, arri are arriving at a certain rate, maybe like five per year or so. So when you look at a small, small, small slice of time, the probability that there's an earthquake or not is proportional to that overall rate of five earthquakes per year, but you have to multiply it by this interval t. And the thing is that when you take t to be extremely small, the probability of having more than one earthquake is going to be negligible with respect to the probability of having no earthquakes or one earthquake. Okay, Those are going to be our assumptions. It might, they might look a little bit weird the first time you encounter them, but this is quite um, intuitive because the idea is there's events happening independently. The earthquakes just happen from time to time independently and they happen at a certain rate, but we don't know when they are going to happen. And the way we capture that is by saying, like, if you look at a very, very small interval, the probability of having an earthquake is proportional to this earthquake rate lambda. And if this interval is small enough, there's not going to be more than one earthquake, or like the probability is just going to be negligible. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. This third assumption is this assumption that more earthquakes within a very small interval, uh, we don't need to worry about that because it's going to be negligible when we take the intervals. Uh, length to be zero. Negligible with respect to the probability of seeing an earthquake or seeing no earthquake within that interval. Hopefully the assumptions make sense. Now let's derive a parametric model based on these assumptions. So the question is, under these assumptions, what is the probability of seeing A earthquakes? Again, like maybe A is not the best. I should have written probably K earthquakes because this just looks like a typo that I wanted to write a earthquake or something. All right, so our strategy is going to be the following. We're going to take this year that we're interested in, okay, and we're going to cut it up into n slots. Maybe I'll so okay, and all of these guys have the same length. <laughs> Although they don't, you're going to imagine that here each of these guys have length one over n. Okay, we're going to imagine that we have discretized the year into n slots. Each of them have length one over n, and we're going to consider the limit where n goes to infinity because we want these slots to be arbitrarily small so that we can apply our assumptions about this earthquake arrival. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to actually save this picture, even though it's not my best work in case we need it later. All right, so what's the probability of A earthquakes? Look, we're already going to use my picture. So now what am I saying? I'm saying, what's the probability that in this N slots, I'm going to see A earthquakes? So let's say that A is equal to 3. What's the probability that I see like that three of these slots have an earthquake inside under our assumptions? If you think about it, under our assumptions, if these slots are sufficiently small, okay, uh, we're taking a limit, 
okay, we have A earthquakes in N slots. What is the distribution? Oops, I, I gave it away. Hopefully you didn't see that. Um, what is the distribution of the, <laughs> sorry about that. What is the distribution of the number of slots that are going to be occupied? Well, and there are assumptions whether there is an earthquake or not in each slot. These are independent events and they have the same probability. The probability is exactly lambda times the width of this interval. So lambda divided by n. Okay, so I don't know if this will sound familiar, but you have n possible slots. They're occupied with a certain probability that I'm going to call theta equal to lambda over n. How many of those slots are occupied if they're independent? That's just a binomial random variable with parameters n and lambda over n. And if you were quick, you probably already saw that this was a binomial when I screwed up as I was uh, flipping through the slides. Okay, so again, the parameter of the binomial is lambda over n. So this is where theta usually goes and one minus theta goes and we have a and n minus a. Now, instead of theta, we have lambda over n. All right, so under our assumptions, we have this binomial. But remember that we're taking the limit where n goes to infinity. From here on, though, it's just math. We just have to expand this, um, expand the binomial coefficient and do a little bit of math. This is not too interesting. You need to know a couple of things. You need to know that this limit is equal to the exponential of minus lambda and that here this limit is equal to 1 because essentially things cancel out when you take n to infinity. So we end up with this formula for the probability of observing a earthquakes once we have taken n to infinity. So again, we're cutting up the year into slots. We get n slots. The pro under our assumption, the probability of seeing a earthquakes within those n slots um, is just a binomial, like it's given by a binomial, by the, um, the binomial PMF. We plug in the value of the parameter, which is lambda over n, and then we take the limit where n goes to infinity because we're considering arbitrarily small slots, and we get this probability. And that is actually the Poisson, the, this is the, the PMF of the Poisson evaluated at A. Realize that the number of earthquakes can go from zero to infinity, but they're countable, right? It's zero, one, two, three, up to infinity. This gives us the probability of um, the probability of observing A earthquakes for all of those values of A. Because there are that, that covers all the possibilities, this PMF is indeed going to add up to one. I encourage you to check that on your own, right? So the PMF of a Poisson random variable is a PMF that has this parameter lambda, which again, intuitively is kind of the rate at which these earthquakes are arriving. And it has this PMF, which tells us the probability of seeing a certain number of earthquakes within, within a year. You can also use this before we actually look at the PMF. I, I would like to say that you can also use this to model many other things like arrival of telephone calls, arrival of emails, um, particle decay. This is used all over the place in, in physics, for example, when, when there's a radioactive material and you want to uh, compute the probability that a certain number of particles have decayed. Because the assumptions approximately hold also in those situations. There's a single parameter for the Poisson distribution, which tells us the number of earthquakes. So if the number of earthquakes per year, the rate of earthquakes per year is 10, we're kind of going to see around 10 earthquakes. So that makes a lot of sense. But of course, uh, you know, with different probabilities. So the probability for 20 is very low, for 30 is extremely low, around 10 is really high, and then close to zero is low again. All right. If we increase the rate, we should see the probabilities going to the right because a higher number of earthquakes is going to be more likely. And that's indeed what we see okay, as we increase lambda. Notice that in the process of deriving the Poisson distribution, we actually showed that if you have a binomial distribution that has parameters n and lambda over n, when you go, when you take n to infinity, this binomial distribution converges to a Poisson distribution. This is called convergence in distribution. The most famous example of that, and we'll talk about this in a while, is the central limit theorem where things converge to a Gaussian. But this is also an example of convergence in distribution. We have binomial distributions that are converging uh, to Poisson. 
in general, when we do mathematical derivations, it's always really good to try to visualize what is going on kind of intuitively. In our case, we had these binomial distributions. Okay, here I'm going to fix n equals 40, and I'm going to, um, no, no, I'm not going to fix n equals 40, sorry. We're going to fix lambda equals 20, and then we're going to change n and see if we see this convergence behavior, right? So we had this binomial PMF, and then we took n to infinity, right? So we're increasing n, and what we see is that indeed this converges very fast to something that is essentially the same as a Poisson with lambda equals 20. Okay, so we observe this numerically. It's always a good idea to check numerically that whatever you're proving mathematically actually holds. Okay, so now we're going to use the Poisson distribution to model some real data. As I said, Poisson distributions are actually very uh, commonly used to uh, model things like telephone call arrivals. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to model the number of calls between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. on weekdays in a, um, um, in a call center in a bank. This is some publicly available data set. So when we use, we're not going to talk about how exactly we uh, choose lambda based on the data. We're going to use maximum likelihood, which we, we, we used maximum likelihood, which we will explain in the following video. But, you know, for now, this is the fit that we obtain. The Poisson model is shown by the white markers. The empirical PMF are the black dots. What we see here is that the Poisson, you know, the parametric distribution can, kind of adapts quite well to the data, except for two things. One, it doesn't account for the fact that you can have a large number of calls uh, with, you know, probability as, is relatively high. And second of all, the probability of zero is pretty high with respect to what the parametric model ex ex expects. The reason for this is actually we, we can explain this departure from our assumptions in that uh, the data set probably includes days that are holidays. So even though it's within the week, like it's a Monday, but it's some kind of holiday, I think the bank is in Israel, so some kind of national holiday there. So there are no calls and the parametric model cannot account for that, right? Because we're assuming that the calls arrive kind of uniformly in the sense that if you take any slot, it has the same probability. Okay, so here you see how a departure from our assumptions means that the parametric model is not going to account for some of the structure in the data. We're going to talk a lot more about this when we compare non-parametric and parametric models in one of the following videos. All right, and that's it. We derived a Poisson distribution motivated by trying to uh, model the number of earthquakes uh, arriving, like occurring in San Francisco over a year. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.